Hello and welcome. We are coming to you from the sidelines of the City India Investor Forum 2024. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleague Nimesh. Uh, we are sitting down with the top brains on the equity side at City India. W joining us now is Surindra Goyal, who is head of research at uh, City India. We have Saurabh Handa, who tracks oil and gas and telecom uh, at City India. Kunal Shah looks at banks and financial services. Uh, gentlemen, great to have all of you here. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, Surinder, if I can start by asking you to kick, kick us off here in terms of what the sentiment, what the mood is like. You know, I was talking with Samiran earlier and uh, he jokingly was saying that in his meetings with investors, etc., he was saying the question he gets is not what can go right from here because everything is going right, but what can go wrong. But how would you characterize the mood? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having us here. So I think, I think uh, the way I would characterize it is that investors are quite positive. Mm. But at the same time, people also worry about the fact that the market has outperformed its peers mm. significantly, yeah. right? And valuations are at premium levels, so people do worry about the risks. So on the positive side, if I think about it, obviously India's standing in the global world and that's kind of reflect, getting reflected in the benchmark weights, mm. not only in EM, but also on the international side, which is World X US. So you are seeing India's weight go up, so obviously more, more and more people get interested. At the same time, liquidity in the market has eased up meaningfully. Like I remember many years back, clients used to ask us how many stocks in India mm. trade at over $50 million a day, and it used to be a very small number. Mm. We did that exercise two weeks back, right? And at least in our coverage, we had 35 plus stocks, mm. which are trading more than $50 million a day. Mm. So that automatically allows investors to take bigger positions, right? And then obviously there are challenges in other parts of EM, which is also helping the Indian market relatively. Mm. So those are obviously all the positives, but at the same time, people are worried there has been significant outperformance. In pockets, it does feel like a lot of exuberance. Yeah. So investors are constantly also asking what can go wrong from here? Mm. What are the risks, right? And, and the other question which also comes up is like mass consumption still looks weak. Right, so how long can you have the market doing well without mass consumption starting to show some kind of a pickup? Yeah. So I think I would say there is optimism, but at the same time, people are cautious given the significant outperformance which has already played out. Mm. So Rindra, more so from the mid and small cap, you know, that came in a conversation as well with the investors. That's one pocket which has relatively outperformed and, and looks like now there is a fraud in some pocket, not on the overall. How are you, how are you positioned in the, in the small and mid cap and what are you suggesting the clients? Yeah. So say, I would say a couple of things there. Firstly, if you look at small and mid caps in general as a category, the earnings growth post COVID has been much stronger. Quite stronger. Okay. Yeah. So to that extent, I don't think the entire outperformance, mm -hmm. right, can be termed as speculative in any manner, right? The second thing is if you look at the flow dynamics, last year bulk of the money came in what we call as mid eligible yeah. funds. Yes. Right, so small cap, mid cap, flexi cap, True. right? Those can also invest significantly, right? So I think all those things are helping that category, but you are right, I, we are quite selective. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have said that we find risk reward more attractive here in large caps. And to that extent, we are more selective, but again, there are opportunities in small and mid caps also. Sure. Mm. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, your sector is seeing a lot of action, right? Uh, city gas distribution companies, straight off the bat, I mean, that comes to one's mind because that is so recent. Yeah. Uh, and you downgraded MGL as well recently. So, <coughs> yes. Tell us what is the investment thesis now for that sector? Right. Okay, so what's happened lately uh, amongst the city gas companies is um, there has been, I think, um, some sort of regulatory risk that has crept in. Uh, so there has been, um, you know, some um, commentary by the government that maybe margins uh, by the companies are a bit on the higher side. The focus is perhaps has been more on margins than volumes and setting up infrastructure, which is essentially what the government's focus is. The government has now mapped out the entire country in terms of city gas uh, licenses. Uh, they have a target of increasing uh, the usage of gas in India's energy mix from 6% to 15%. So they are sort of in their minds doing whatever is needed in terms of pricing reforms, in terms of infrastructure, etc. And they now also want the industries to start participating in terms of building out that infrastructure. 
So our uh, downgrade was prompted by some of these uh, concerns that I would say have only recently kept, uh, crept in as far as margins are concerned. But was there a tactical downgrade or you think structurally things are, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, you need to kind of, uh, we spoke, by the yeah. way, with the PNGRB member, yes. uh, and, and we asked him point blank, he said, yeah. will prices be determined by market forces? He said, yeah. yes, absolutely, no yeah. question about it. But, of course, also that you know, margins perhaps should be in the 12 to 15% yeah. range, not the, uh, near 20% that some of these companies have been yeah. making. So we don't know how both those things will square, but that's what they told us. I mean, exactly. I think there's a bit of uncertainty right now. I mean, we don't really know what they mean by 12% or 15%. So the comments are a bit, I would say, generic at this stage. So is there going to be a bit more regulation that starts creeping in? It remains to be seen. But structurally, we are positive on the gas story in India. We have um, you know, done detailed reports on how the overall demand CAGR for gas in India could go up to almost 7% over the next few years. And then it trickle down, trickles down to some of these companies. So but gas is not the way to play it? So at this point of time, I mean, Gale is one of our only buys in the gas space. Okay. Uh, we do still have a buy on IGL, which is a city gas company. Uh, but there, actually, what has happened is IGL has, you know, gotten derated because of the EV risk uh, in, in Delhi, and which is why the stock had actually not gone up that much, unlike peers like MGL and Gujarat Gas. So in a way, at, at, some, at, uh, at this point of time, valuations were where we were not very comfortable. Um, but yeah, city gas also will be an interesting play. But, I sir, think you're, once you're the more bullish dust on settles. the OMCs, right? I mean, the, uh, I, I saw your note where it says uh, that uh, the LNG prices have gone up, which will be a hit for OMCs, but that would mean that the retail fuel prices may not go up. What's your sense on the OMCs, and do you feel, do you still believe that there is a lot, lot of valuation catch-up which can happen? in the OMC stocks, especially HPCL and BBCL. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I mean, um, we are still positive on the OMCs. The government has announced a cut in domestic LPG prices, which maybe in increases the under-recoveries for them in the near term. But then um, there's a bit of seasonality in LPG. Typically, international prices come down in the summer. So we are not particularly worried on that front. Petrol and diesel is what typically hawks the line are, right. Are investors worried that there could be a, a fuel price cut just before the yeah. elections and all, and that can be a bit of a damper? Yeah, so I think two reasons driving that. One is in general, before yeah. elections, there is a concern that maybe prices could get cut. Secondly, after the CGD action, there was a view that could this ex be extrapolated to the OMCs. We disagree. Uh, we think the cases are quite different. In the CGDs, there is a question of you know getting priority allocation of cheap gas, which the OMCs do not really enjoy. There's a question of exclusivity, which again in the OMCs is not the case. I would say OMCs have by and large been fairly uh, disciplined on pricing. We still remain positive. Uh, the stocks have done really well over the last six months, exactly. but if you see valuations, they're still very comfortable. Uh, what I think people tend to forget is that you can have good years and bad years in the, o in the OMC space, but over like a 10-year period, Stocks like BPCL, HPCL have given you 20% plus yeah. ROEs. The stocks are still trading at 1.7, 1.8 times. So mm -hmm. we are still quite comfortable on valuations. Yes, there, there can be a little bit of uh, you know, election uncertainty. I think the last weekend's events probably suggest that maybe even that uncertainty may not actually play out because uh, crude prices are not at that level where you can cut petrol diesel prices. But after two weeks, I think things should anyway be clear. So we would be buyers. And in any case, do you believe that you know, we, uh, it was the best of, it, it has been the best of times for banking as well. So, so everything is cyclical. So we are probably at a bit of a, uh, at a top. So, you know, things will naturally uh, slope off a little bit, a uh, little bit there. What's your view, Kunal? So particularly with respect to regulators action. Mm -hmm. So it started when they increased the risk weights, particularly for say lending to NBFC as well as uh, for unsecured lending. And at that time, it was an indication that maybe there are few segments which are hitting up. Uh, particularly on the low ticket uh, unsecured side and uh, you need to be slightly cautious about it and that's where this uh, actions were there when we look at it in terms of the company specific actions I think this was more to do with their own internal policies and maybe uh, when you look at it in terms of the processes and that's been highlighted in the uh, circulars as well uh, so it doesn't seem to be uh, maybe in general but uh, uh, definitely if there is a process lab uh, laps, if there is a much uh, higher or exponential growth in any of these sub-segments, that's, uh, uh, that's what uh, RBI is very closely monitoring. And it's a clear indication that uh, maybe everyone needs to be watchful about but it. But in your coverage universe, banks and financial institutions that you track, do you get a sense that RBI is a lot more 
sort of proactive, and it's not just penalties, which is what the route they took through much of 2023 uh, and before that as well. It's slightly more strict, stricter kind of action, uh, so or not really? I would say it's more in terms of being proactive before anything happens. Okay, so earlier maybe when you look at it, uh, there have been several product segments wherein uh, we had seen a lot of knocks. Okay, mm. and this time RBI completely wants to maybe avoid that, and that's the reason we are seeing such kind of a more proactive uh, uh, measures being taken. Uh, so yeah, this is more kind of a proactive action from mm. the regulator. Uh, two part question. One on the PSU banks. Uh, they've not been, you know, big outperformers in the entire PSU basket. But I was just looking at your your stock recommendations. In fact, you have a sell on SBI, which is relatively underperformed in the PSU basket. What's your sense on the PSU banks overall? And within that, uh, how, what is your pecking order be? Yeah. So uh, we recently released the update on uh, uh, PSU banks, and overall, when you look at it, most of the PSU banks they have been able to bridge the one percent ROA mark. Yeah. And that has been well supported by, I would say, credit cost as well in particular. There has been some improvement on the margin side. On growth, even though it's improved from their recent historical average, but it's still below the industry average, both on deposits as well as on the uh, lending side. In terms of margins, it still seems limited lever available for the entire industry as such and uh, nothing specific to PSU banks. But for some banks, there are still credit cost levers which are there. Okay. And uh, it's not for all of them. Like say, you mentioned like we have a sell on SBI. Because if you look at it, SBI last three quarters, they are already at less than 20 basis points of credit cost. Yes. So that's not the sustainable one. It will have to normalize over a period. But there are other banks which are still running at a much higher credit cost, maybe somewhere around 130 to 170 odd basis points. And would we see some kind of benefit in the credit cost cycle getting reflected for some of them? That's quite obvious. And that's where we have Bank of Baroda as a pick within the uh, PSU space. So we have a buy on that name as such. Uh, and there we see some further levers on the ROA improvement side. Do you see the credit cost cycle turning a little bit? We had Amitabh Chaudhary, for example, of Axis, who basically made this point. He said, how can it be that a large institution runs 20 basis points of, yeah. you know, it has to uh, go up a little bit. It'll, you think we are at that point uh, over the next one or two quarters where we'll start to see that? So the way it is, what currently is happening is we are seeing a lot of benefit of the recoveries mm. of the pain which maybe most of the banks took during COVID. Mm. And, and because of the recoveries, in fact, today, credit costs are much below historical average, mm. like say 20, 30, 40 basis points. That's not the normalized levels. Mm. And everyone got the benefit of these recoveries. Now, eventually, would it normalize to a steady state level? Obviously. Mm. Would it still take time? Is, is it still away? Few quarters, definitely yes. So is it like it's coming up, there is a catch up just in next two quarters or so? We also don't believe that. But getting into like if you look at most of our FY26 estimates, mm. there we believe that we will see the normalization of credit cost. Is it like we are seeing a worry on the credit cost trajectory wherein it will be higher than the normalized level? That doesn't seem to be the situation. There are a few pockets wherein stress is uh, emerging, but it's not like we will again nothing see the alarming credit. Or yeah, it's nothing like all. alarming in a, overall on the credit cost side. So. What are your top bets? I mean, in this in the space. So uh, in private, uh, we like ICICI, Indusind, and uh, HDFC Bank. On and within NBFCs? NBFCs? And within NBFCs, we like uh, uh, Chola, we like uh, L&D Finance, and we like Avas. So, the, uh, within the IT, uh, the next big catalyst or the, or the event to watch would be uh, what Infosys and HCL Tech says in, in April, right, for the next year outlook. What's generally your sense on, on the entire IT space and within, uh, within the IT names, would you be more comfortable with the mid-cap IT or you'd go with the large caps like the TCS and the Wipro's and the Infosys of the world? Right. So, so firstly, on IT services, we are expecting a slow recovery. Sure. Okay, so like one of the things which played out in this year mm -hmm. is that while US growth has continuously surprised on the upside, but Indian IT growth has only seen downgrades, yeah. right? So you are getting to a point where year over year, the comps are getting easier, mm -hmm. right? And then towards the second half, you should see some recovery. Yeah. So definitely it feels like we should see an improvement, but we don't think the improvement will be as much as the market is already building it. Is building it. Okay. okay, so it will be a slow kind of a recovery, and that is the reason 
we are still quite cautious on the space overall. In addition to that, there is the additional thing to worry about on what GCCs do to incremental spending, mm. because that's somewhere we have seen a lot of traction in the GCC space. Mm. Secondly, the industry keeps on getting fragmented, right? Like if you look at the situation versus five, six years back, the smaller players are a lot more relevant, yeah. right? They are starting to win somebody in insurance, someone yeah. in BFS, but they are starting to win more, which, incre which, which increases the fragmentation for everybody in a market where growth is not as strong, right? So given this entire backdrop, we are still cautious. Now on the second part of your questions, small caps versus, uh, the large, versus the large caps. Yeah. See, large caps, I think from a growth perspective, the well-run mid-caps will still deliver faster growth. Mm. And that's something we have consistently written yeah. because our belief was around five years, six years back, the market structure itself changed a bit in favor of the mid-caps because of cloud, because of digital, right? Because of a lot of management change where the smaller companies had guys from senior, uh, larger companies coming in to lead and so on. Right, those things are still in place, but today when you look at the valuation gap, mm. a lot higher growth in the mid caps is already priced in. So to that extent, on a one year basis, risk reward wise, we find some of the large caps better, okay. but even there we are very selective, right? Okay. If you look at our recommendations, we are very, very selective on the sure. sector. Uh, Just to take off, Namesh, yeah. on that point on PSUs, yeah. PSU banks, <laughs> on PSUs <laughs> overall, uh, is there a, what's your, what's your thesis, Surindra? No, is no, so we are still constructive, mm. right? If you look at the list of preferred stocks that we publish, yeah. mm. there are quite a few PSU stocks in there. And uh, see, the, the starting point was a few, say, say a year, couple of years back, looking at everything in terms of the business outlook and valuations, you had bottom-up stories mm. on the PSU side, mm. which were like really attractively priced in context of the market, mm. right? It could be a defense stock, sure. it could be a utility stock, for example, right? Those were like really attractively priced. Yeah. And that's how, and, and again, it's not like we decided that they come into the preferred list because they're PSU, sure, sure. right? It was like, okay, great story, good valuations. It has to be in the preferred list. And then the situation for OMC is improved, the gas stocks improved, so you have some gas stocks, some OMC, which has also come into that list. Even today where we sit, some of those stocks look very attractive on risk reward, particularly when you look at valuations across the space. Mm -hmm. The entire market is definitely, there are a lot of sectors mm -hmm. which are trading two standard deviation above five year and 10 year means. Mm -hmm. In that context, some of the stocks still look quite attractive. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I think you also have to keep in mind that there, is likely to be more capex driven growth mm. which may benefit some companies more and in the past if you go back and see the prior cycle mm. where india had a great run on capex some of the stocks were actually trading much higher than yes. where they are trading today or in line with where they are trading today sure. uh, so sort of, uh, the other sector that you track closely is telecom and there is a lot of uh, hope and belief that maybe post elections you will see a tariff hike across the board Generally, what's been your call on the telecom sector? And within that, I believe you are very bullish on and constructive on uh, in this tower. Your rational, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, so we also subscribe to the view that tariff hikes should be coming. It's hard to say whether it happens immediately after elections or with a bit of a lag, but sometime this year. Uh, we are calling for roughly around a 15% sort of tariff hike in the okay. 4G space, uh, which should benefit the ARPUs uh, of these companies. Uh, we've been positive on Bharti for a while for the last few years. So we maintain our positive stance there. Uh, we believe it's, it's a very strong structural story. Uh, execution has been very strong. They're gaining market share. There is a, a laser focus on deleveraging, on FCF generation, etc. And even CapEx should start coming down next year. Uh, on Indus, yes, so we had taken a contrarian view Yeah, you had a contra year. on interaction, yes. yeah. Yes, so, um, so we continue to maintain our buy view there. We, we've in fact recently raised our target price yes. there to 320. Um, as Surendra was mentioning, that's another stock which is still trading at below long-term means. It's trading maybe at six times EV EBITDA. It's long-term is seven, seven and a half, and I think rightly so. I mean, there has been massive consolidation in the okay. space. They've, they've obviously had challenges over the last couple of years primarily because of, um, you know, uh, how even one of the players has, uh, has uh, played out. But things are changing, first of all. Um, they should be generating good free cash flow next year, in our view. There is scope for reinstatement of dividends. Yeah. 
Uh, and you're, as you're aware, there is a potential fundraise that mm -hmm. Voda Idea is um, seeking to do. Do you and think we'll have a viable Vodafone idea? Stronger, viable? Um, uh, as a, as a I mean, if the fundraise, it depends on the fundraise. If it uh, gets complete, then certainly it should yeah. be in a much uh, stronger position, at least to catch up. So they have lagged a bit on 4G investments. They haven't managed to roll out 5G as yet. So they do need investments to keep up pace with the other two. So clearly, they'll be in a much better position. But you call an industry tower is not tied to whether... Uh, uh, not yet. So our bull case would be tied to that. Tied so, to that. The, so our base case assumes uh, a status quo sort of situation. Uh, but we've actually highlighted that, assuming that the Boda Idea fundraise goes through, and they've had challenges in completing that over the last couple of years. If this time is indeed different, hmm. uh, then we believe that there is further upside to hmm. end us beyond our base case of 320. Surendra, so, your uh, target for this year on Nifty doesn't suggest too much of an upside. From a viewer perspective, uh, what would be your sense? Will this be a year of consolidation? Will only select large caps do well? Br briefly, you can tell us what you expect for the next second half of the year. Yeah. So, so see, our uh, view was, so this is a target we put out, I think, in the first week of December. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of upside did get captured in December. True. Okay, which was partly because of the state election outcome, yeah. which, which, which obviously gave investors a view on what could potentially happen. All right. So, some of that upside got priced in. As I said, valuations are premium, particularly when you compare it to other emerging markets. And that's the reason we feel that it might be more range-bound in the okay. near term with more selective opportunities mm -hmm. rather than kind of the market continuing to rally. Okay. We're also cognizant of the fact that there has been a lot of incremental buying which has come in because mm -hmm. the market has done well. Sure. Right and but given the flows and given the valuations where we are and, and, and in terms of earnings as well, how big could be the downside risk from these levels? No, so, so I think uh, so. Like if you look at our last note, what we have been writing is that we are constructive medium term, sure. but it does feel like that there could be a risk of consolidation, sure. given how well the market has already done. And to that extent, I think one should still be selective near term. Surendra, uh, just one aspect, I mean, uh, retail flows, right? They become such an important part and uh, it's coming in every month it's coming in. And in the initial phase said, well, you know, the retail comes in at the top and one down cycle. And the, but it's a very steady, almost structural kind of thing. Yeah. We're sticky, right? How do you, uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, how can that really change what stocks trade at? I mean, if you looked at other countries which have gone through the similar kind of experience and uh, just, just your sense. Yeah. So see, flows is always very difficult to predict, mm. okay? Yeah. The only thing I would say here is that a lot of flows have generally come in at a time when the markets have only been grinding higher, mm. yeah. right? And particularly if you look at, say, post-COVID or even even COVID was not that long a fall, yeah. right? So it means pretty much every dip is a chance to buy. Mm. And that has really worked so far. Mm. So I think that could really get challenged when you have an event which can drive the risk of downside where people actually see some serious downside. Mm. That is what I think will really test this money coming in. But otherwise, it's been good. And we have, from a rates perspective, we have seen one full cycle, right, where we did not see flows really suffering. So to that extent, I think you need some kind of an event which tests that, yeah. okay, is this money patient enough to hold when you get that downside? Or a period of no returns. Uh, so I long think, I of think of yeah, so that could, that. that could also be true, but that I think takes out some of the really short term money, mm. right? I don't think it really challenges people who have put in money with mm. a three year mindset, mm. right? There could be like, okay, people have come in for a quick buck. Those kind of people might be like, okay, this market doesn't deliver as much as we thought. Sure. Yeah. But I don't think that could, you get a downside event mm. that I think will really test this. All right, I think uh, that gets us to a close in this conversation. Uh, Surendra, great to have you with us here. Saurabh, appreciate your time here. Kunal, thank you very much. All three of you, thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.